do, do the Marxists have sympathy for the working class? George Orwell was interested in this question. And so he wrote this book called Wigan, Road to Wigan Pier, which I would highly recommend. It's on a reading list I made. It's on my website. You can check that out. Those are books that have been particularly influential to me. And so Orwell was a socialist. He wrote the book for the Left Book Club, um, which published a kind of a socialist book once a month. Um, Orwell, by the time he wrote this book, he was already awake. You know, by, in the 1920s, after the Russian Revolution, no one really knew what to make of what was happening in what would become the Soviet Union, right? I mean, it was after World War I, the planet was in ashes for all intents and purposes, the old aristocratic order was crumbling, um, it was a horror show. And these revolutionaries came out with these new ideas and tried to give the in principle, give the working class a break, and everybody watched to see what would happen. And um, the honest people and the intellectuals watched, and I separate them for a reason. Um, but by 1920, 21, 22, something like that, it was obvious already that something was rotten in the state of Denmark. Malcolm Muggeridge went over to the Soviet Union to check out how the collectivization of the farms was going, and he found out it was actually pretty murderous. Right, because what, this, what the communists did was round up all the successful farmers and rape them and kill them and steal everything they had and send them off to Siberia. Which turned out actually to be a pretty bad idea. Now you think, you think about it, those people were, were serfs not very long before, a couple of generations at most. And they were so not much more than slaves and some of them had risen up to the point where they may have had a nice brick house and a couple of cows and maybe a person working for them or two and there was a small proportion of the agriculturalists in the Soviet Union that were producing most of the food. And that's just how it goes because that's a Pareto distribution issue. In any field where there's human productivity, a small proportion of the people produce almost all of the output. It's actually the square root of the number of people in the field produce half the output. So if you have 100 farmers, 10 of them produce half the food. But if you have 10,000, 100 of them produce half the food. Okay, so what happens when you kill all the good farmers? You starve six million Ukrainians to death in the 1930s. And, you know, that's not something that's all that widely known, but if you want to uh, provide some additional fodder for your nightmares, you could go online and read about what happened to the Ukrainians in the 1930s. So that, underneath the, under the collectivization principles, so let's say you were a mother and you were starving to death and so were your children and, you know, the communists had come in and forcibly collectivized you and then they took all the grain that your collective farm had produced and they shipped it all to the city, say, and so that's all done and you think, okay, you know, the city's got to eat and so then you go out in the field to pick up the grains that the harvesters missed so that you can, you know, the ones that they've been lying there, they're not so good, there's not that many of them, you go out and glean, you pick up the seeds that weren't picked up uh, so you can feed your kids so they don't die. And so what's the punishment for that? Death. Because you were obliged under the collectivization orders to turn in any additional grains that you happen to pick off the ground to the authorities so that they could be, well, who knows, but at least so, you, so they could be shipped to the cities, I suppose, which is, of course, absurd, because, of course, that would never happen. But it was mostly so that you could just actually die. So, okay. Anyways, back to the road to Wigan Pier. Now, I'm going to read you a little bit about, about, from the book. So, Orwell went out to this mining town in the northern UK, and coal miners, Orwell had sympathy for the working class. He really worked on that his whole life, because he was a middle class, upper middle class, snobby type Englishman, and he knew it. Um, and he tried really hard to overcome that. He, 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 he served in the Spanish Civil War. He wandered around as a tramp. He worked in, in, in low-end restaurants. He worked as a low-end worker in restaurants in Paris and, and in London. He has a very good book. Uh, I think it's called Down and Out in Paris and London that describes that. Like, he was a seriously committed dude and really a smart guy. And so he's going up to these terrible towns in the northern UK where the coal miners worked and had their families. And, you know, they had hard lives. 
They, they had hard lives, and that's just saying nothing. You know, the coal miners that he met, they didn't have any teeth by the time they were 30. He said, the women he talked to said, teeth are just a misery. It's better to get rid of them as soon as you can. Um, and, and, and they went and the men went and mined coal, and that was rough. You know, they all had black lung by the time they were 40, and they were, they were done, fundamentally. But here's a, just a bit, a bit of a story about how hard their lives were. So they had to go in the mines during the day. So they never saw the day, so that's one thing. They had to go to the mines, and then they had to, like, knock coal off the walls. That's hard, with hammers and picks and all of that. And they had to move it. But that was, that was their job. But there was the commute. So here was the commute. So imagine that the typical tunnel was about that high, something like that. And the typical coal miner was about that high. Well, that's a problem, eh? Because you've got to walk through those tunnels to get to work. So you have to walk like this. And then the question might be, well, how far do you have to walk to work? And the answer is three and a half miles. And that's how far you have to walk back from work after you put your eight-hour shift in at the coal mine. And the, you don't get paid for the commute. And so, <laughs> Orwell said that was more or less like climbing a small mountain in the morning before you went to work and then climbing another one at night before you went home. And so that was just, I mean, believe me, I'm telling you very little about how tough their lives were, but that gives you a little flavor. Actually, one day like that for a modern person, you're just, you're dead, eh? or you wish you were dead anyways. And so Orwell talks about going up there to stay in terrible places he lived in while he was up there, and the terrible food he ate, and, and the miserable, wretched scenes that he saw. And here's one of the miserable, wretched scenes. He's on a train through the neighborhoods. He says, the train bore me away through the monstrous scenery of slag heaps, chimneys, piled scrap iron, foul canals, paths of cindery mud, crisscrossed by the prints of clogs. This was March, but the weather had been horribly cold, and everywhere there were mounds of blackened snow. As we moved slowly through the outskirts of the town, we passed row after row of little gray slum houses running at right angles to the embankment. At the back of one of the houses, a young woman was kneeling on the stones, poking a stick up the leaden waste pipe which ran from the sink inside and which I suppose was blocked. I had time to see everything about her, her sack apron, her clumsy clogs, her arms reddened by the cold. She looked up as the train passed, and I was almost near enough to catch her eye. She had a round, pale face, the usual exhausted face of the slum girl who's 25 and looks 40, thanks to miscarriages and drudgery, and it wore, for the second in which I saw it, the most desolate, hopeless expression I have ever seen. It struck me then that we, meaning the middle class at that time, are mistaken when we say that it isn't the same for them as it would be for us, and that people bred in the slums can imagine nothing but the slums. For what I saw in her face was by no means the ignorant suffering of an animal. She knew well enough what was happening to her, understood as well as I did how dreadful a destiny it was to be kneeling there in the bitter cold on the slimy stones of a slum backyard, poking a stick up a foul drain pipe. All right. So, Orwell writes the first part of the book. And it details the lives of these people. And then he makes an argument. He says, like, how can you read about this? How can you know about this without having some sympathy for redistribution schemes and, social and socialist ideas? And so he's actually asking himself this question. It's not just a rhetorical question. He's, I mean, he's a serious guy, right? He, went, he goes up there and he tells you a story that... You have to have a heart of stone if you, if, you don't, if you read that and you don't think, man, something should be done about this. It's really awful. So he set up this situation where your sympathies are completely with the people that he's describing. But socialism wasn't all that popular in Britain at that time. And, and, so, and socialists weren't all that popular with Orwell. He didn't really like them that much. And he was trying to figure out why that was. So this is what he wrote in the second part of the book. Now, this got him in a lot of trouble. They didn't want to publish his damn book after he wrote the second part. Uh, but he fought with them, and he got it published, and it's a classic, and, and people still read it, and you should read it, because it's a great book, and Orwell's a great writer. And Orwell was another one of those people 
intellectuals who woke up pretty early, you know, Orwell wrote Animal Farm in 1984, he wrote 1984 and 1948, um, wrote Animal Farm approximately around the same time. He knew what was happening under Stalin, and he wasn't afraid to say it. But it was a message that in some sense fell on deaf ears, especially among the intelligentsia, and there was complicated reasons for that. But, um, but it wasn't like the facts weren't there for people to see them if they wanted to. And as I already said, Muggeridge, Malcolm Muggeridge, had made it pretty clear in the 1920s. And that was widely publicized, by the way, throughout the UK, what was happening during de kulakization the Kulaks being the farmers that I talked about earlier who, who had committed the unspeakable sin of crawling out of their serf status over a couple of generations to the point where they weren't mere property and half-starved. So this is what Orwell had to say about socialists. It might be said, however, that even if the theoretical oriented book-trained socialist is not a working man himself, at least he is actuated by a love of the working class. He's endeavoring to shed his bourgeois status and fight on the side of the proletariat. Obviously that must be his motive. But is it? Sometimes I look at a socialist, the intellectual, tracked, writing type of socialist, with his pullover, his fuzzy hair, and his Marxist quotation, and wonder what the devil his motive really is. It's really difficult to believe that it's a love of anybody, especially of the working class, from whom he is, of all people, the furthest removed. The truth is that to many people calling them socialists, revolution does not mean a movement of the masses with which they hope to associate themselves. It means instead a set of reforms which we, the clever ones, are going to impose upon them, the lower orders. On the other hand, it would be a mistake to regard the book-trained socialist as a bloodless creature entirely incapable of emotion. Though seldom giving much evidence of affection for the exploited, he is perfectly capable of displaying hatred sort of queer, theoretical, in vacuo hatred against the exploiters. Hence the grand old socialist sport of denouncing the bourgeoisie. It is strange how easily almost any socialist writer can lash himself into frenzies of rage against the class to which, by birth or by adoption, he himself almost invariably belongs. Now I worked for the NDP when I was a kid, and I had privileged access to the leadership for provincially and federally for reasons that I won't go into and I thought that Many of them were honorable people who were really striving to give the working class a voice And I believe that the working class needs a voice a political voice for obvious reasons um, I think the Democrats in the United States have made an absolutely dreadful abysmal mistake replacing their working class political ethos with identity politics. We're going to talk about that. And uh, and I don't think the situation has changed that much. I think one of the things that's happened in the United States is that world stability and peace in some ways has been purchased at the expense of North American working class well-being. You know, because the Chinese have got rich, compared to 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. The, in, the Indians have got rich, again, same comparison basis. There's more middle class people in India now than there are in the United States. Um, the trade arrangements that have been in North America allowed for the rise of middle classes globally. At the same time, they opened up the working class in North America to competition from those low wage sources. And maybe that's a good deal. It's hard to say, right? Because it's not such a bad thing that the Chinese aren't starving, and it's not such a bad thing that the Indians aren't starving, and that those societies are transforming themselves actually into communities that are quite wealthy. It's like, hooray for that. It's an absolutely miraculous transformation. It's the most rapid growth of human wealth in the history of humanity. So we should be pretty happy about that, but we should also remember, at least to some degree, who's paid the price for it. And so, as far as I'm concerned, the working class needs a voice. And it isn't obvious that they have one at the moment. Having said that, however, 
It isn't obvious to me at all that the people who purport to stand for the working class actually do so, or that if they do so, that the reason they do so is because they're all compassionate and sympathetic and loving and kind and saint-like. I'm more convinced by Orwell's argument. So, back to the NDP. The people I met at the leadership level, a lot of them I had a fair bit of admiration for, but as I worked with the party over about a five-year period, there was this contradiction that came kept emerging for me, and that was that I didn't really like the low-level party functionary activist types. Like, they just weren't personally appealing to me. They seemed peevish and resentful. And then, at the same time, I, I was going to college, I was about 17, I got elected to the, sit on the College Board of Governors, and at that time, Alberta was conservative, politically, right? It still is, of course, but they, it was part of the progressive conservative empire because uh, they ruled Alberta forever, and all the Board of Governor members were basically nominees, right? They were conservative nominees, so these were conservative people, and I was an NDP member, and I thought, and I'd worked for small businessmen, too, who weren't NDP. They were, they were conservative. I can never figure that out, but I'll tell you about that in a minute. But I had a bad case of cognitive dissonance, because it actually turned out that I admired the people on the Board of Governors. And they were mostly, it was in Grand Prairie, it's not a very big place, and it's not very old, and so if you were reasonably successful in Grand Prairie, the probability that you had inherited your money from the aristocracy was like zero, because there wasn't one, right? It, the whole damn town was 50 years old. So if you had any influence or, or wealth, you were a small businessman, small to middle-sized businessman, and you'd, you knew what you were doing. And I actually admired these people. I thought, well, that's not very good. I admire them, and I don't share their political views. And then there's these other people with whom I hypothetically share political views, and I don't admire them at all. What's going on? And then I read Road to Wigan Pier, and I thought, oh, that's it. They don't like the poor. They just hate the rich. 